Okay, good afternoon. Um, this is CHE 7130. The title is uh, Heat and Mass Transfer, but we'll actually do transport phenomena. Uh, that'll be, I think, only required core course. We used to have a sequence of two courses, fluid mechanics, followed by heat and mass transfer till last year. But beginning this year, uh, we decided to have just a transport phenomena course that will cover all three, fluid mechanics, heat transfer, and mass transfer. Uh, my name is Nanda Kumar, and I go by the nickname Kumar. And um, for this course, I will use Moodle extensively. So if you log into LSU, uh, you should see this course appear um, on your PASS account. And then you can go into this particular course, and there you will find all the information related to this course uh, beginning today. Um, lecture by lecture for every week, I will put the lecture notes ahead of time. So the idea is that you don't have to take notes in the class. But if you want to print it out, you can print it out and bring it. And then if you want to uh, take additional notes, you can. And I will also record the lecture and post a recorded version of the lecture uh, on Moodle as well. The idea is not to discourage you from attending the class, but uh, in case you need to go back and review sections of the lecture. Suppose I go through very fast, or it's 3.30 after all in the afternoon, you doze off for a while. You can go back and listen to particular sections if you want. So you will basically have a screen capture of everything that happens, including the audio in that, uh, that section. Um, also, I have my schedule in Moodle, which is uh, up to date. And so you can look at it and see when I am free. And uh, if you have any questions about this course, uh, if I'm free according to this schedule, uh, you should be uh, you should feel free to drop in and ask questions. But if you want to schedule a meeting, you can always email me or call me on my phone, and we'll fix up a time, and uh, we can uh, meet. Uh, if you are unable to come to the university and you want to talk to me, uh, there is something called a virtual classroom, and I will demonstrate how this works uh, uh, maybe in one of the future classes. Uh, it basically allows us to interact over the internet from wherever you are. In fact, if you want, we could use that where I give the lecture and you listen to the lecture from your uh, home. Okay, that's possible. Um, but I want to test this. This is the first time LSU has a license for this. It's called Adobe Connect. And uh, I will uh, illustrate it and we'll use it uh, mostly for support, support for tutorial sessions, support for assignments and stuff like that. Uh, if you are not able to uh, c come to my office. So uh, you will find out that I do like technology and I use technology as much as possible to augment the lectures and uh, the normal way of learning. And I encourage you to stop uh, stop me and ask questions anytime. Uh, feel free to do that. And uh, I would like an interactive environment so that, so that I know that I'm getting to you, that you are understanding what I'm talking about. Uh, so this is the modal page. Uh, the course outline is this f first lecture is on modal. So you could have, if you are logged in already, some of you have already done that, I think. I can monitor who is logging in and looking at what material that, that is on modal. And uh, you would have seen this, and maybe print from next lecture, I would recommend that you print out the notes and bring it to the class so that you just sit there and listen to uh, what I'm talking about. Now, certain basic rules. Uh, we already know that we meet uh, Tuesday and Thursday for one and a half hours. Uh, these are my contact information that you will see here. Okay, my office number, my email address, and my phone number. Now, the course evaluation is going to be based on the following roles. That is, there will be uh, maybe seven or eight assignments in this course. And I do expect individual effort in the assignments. Um, it is OK initially to talk to each other to understand, or to talk to me to understand what the problem is about, the conceptual understanding of it. 
but there's going to be a lot of math involved in there. And the math, unless you do it by yourself, you're not going to grasp it. Okay? So there's no point in trying to work collaboratively or copying from someone else. So I do expect individual effort. And if there is any evidence of copying, two people doing the same problem should obviously use different symbols and stuff like that. Okay? So if they're identical, then I will penalize. Uh, I will give a grade of zero for both. And I am not going to get into it. Uh, the question of who copied from whom. Okay? So um, it's important that you work together and it will be worth 20% of the course weight. And the class activities, that is your participation in the class, and uh, uh, there will be something called think, pair, share activities that we will do. Those things, participation in those will, uh, and attendance, for example, you know, you don't take attendance, um, uh, all these things will count towards about 5%. There will be a midterm exam, and uh, I have fixed the date as October 6th. I don't know whether you can see it from the back. These are pretty tiny letters. Um, it is in during the class hour on October 6th, and it will be worth 30%. Okay? And then there will be a final exam, which is set by the university, and that is scheduled for December 8th. And that will be a two-hour exam, and it is starting at 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m will also be held in this room. Okay, I would appreciate if you guys turn off the cell phone. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> the textbook for this course, um, I don't strictly have a single text, but if you want to have a textbook to follow along, this is an excellent book. It's a very classic book written in the 1960s. In a sense, organized this field of transport phenomena by three chemical engineers, Bird, Stewart, and Lightfoot. So it's a very classic book. And there is a recent edition, the second edition of this, that came in 2007. And uh, so I will use that as a kind of reference material. But uh, in the course outline, you will find that there are about 20 or 30 other books that I mentioned. I will take material from different sources in this course. So when I take a material from a different book, I will tell you where I'm taking it from so that you'll have access uh, to it. Um, as I said, in the Moodle page, if you go to before the first lecture, I don't know if you can see it now. OK. Um, I guess I haven't uploaded that. Uh, I will do that after I after the lecture. There would be. Uh, a course outline which talks about what are the things that we are going to cover in this course and uh, uh, also this that has an extensive bibliography. Now here you will see that there are a number of uh, uh, external sources that I have provided links for Wikipedia for example on fluid mechanics on transport phenomena and there are lots of films short films that are uh, illustrating various aspects of fluid mechanics so I have provided links to them and I will recommend that you see from time to time a video on laminar flow, a video on drag reduction, and things like that. Today we are going to look at a video on powers of 10 and some sections of uh, low Reynolds number flow and viscoelastic flows. Uh, but there is a complete film by G.I. Taylor, uh, that film on low Reynolds number flow by G.I. Taylor. I would like all of you to look at that. This is a film that I saw when I was a graduate student almost 30 years ago. And still, it is uh, a great impression on me. I, so every class I teach on fluid mechanics, I actually used to take 30 minutes to show it in the class. But these days, you guys have access to the internet. So you should be able to spend an extra 30 minutes uh, looking at that video. And we will have quizzes and stuff, class participation, uh, based on materials from such uh, external sources. Uh, the other kind of guideline that I have recommended is for every hour of lecture that we do in the class, you should expect to spend seven to eight hours outside. Okay, So that means this is, this is a lot uh, to demand. But most of it will be spent on doing assignments. But you should also read. This is a graduate course. Okay? So you should read other material, other textbooks on the same topic. And gradually, we will try to link you to the current literature, because the graduate course is supposed to take you to that level where you're uh, 
uh, facility in mathematics and computational uh, mechanics are good enough and you are able to relate and read and understand current articles and current issues in uh, a lot of these topics, whether it is chemical engineering, uh, fluid mechanics or reaction engineering or thermodynamics, etc. Okay. So this section will keep on increasing as we go to additional lectures. Uh, I will put assignments there, for example, solutions to assignments, everything will be there uh, in the Moodle page. Any questions or comments for me? Those are basically the ground rules on how the evaluation, that evaluation is not going to be based on absolute scales, it will be based on relative scale. So uh, I will basically use a kind of a curving and uh, so it is important that relative to others you are ahead in the pack uh, if you are aiming for an A or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so my exams may have an average of 52 or something like that. Don't be panicking about that. If the average is 62 and if you are 75, you are the top, you are going to get an A. You don't need a 90 to get an A. Okay. Um, if there are no questions, let's start discussing what this course is about. As I said, transport phenomena. How many of you have taken an undergraduate level transport phenomena course? Fluids. So you, you wouldn't probably have called it as transport phenomena, you would have seen it as fluid mechanics, heat transfer, mass transfer, things like that. Okay. So the transport phenomena approach basically at the graduate level tries to bring in the unity between these three subjects and presents it in a very unified way. Okay. Um, so here, this is a picture from the front cover of the book by Bert Stewart and Light for Transport Phenomena. Um, what, what does this tell us? Does anybody remember from your undergraduate what these equations are called? The, these three equations that I'm circling. No, no, can you see in the back? If not, please come to the front because there's a lot of space here. Okay. Um, I can, of course, try to blow it up. Uh, I'm going to be very quick. Does anybody remember what these equations are called? Right. The one that deals with velocity, it's called Newton's law. It is not, don't confuse it with F equals ma. It's not that Newton's law, but it is called Newton's law of viscosity. So it provides what we call a constitutive relationship between the stress on the left hand side and what is called the rate of strain on the right hand side. Okay? Uh, this is an empirical relationship. It doesn't mean that all material that we find on the planet will obey that linear relationship. What it says is if I plot, if I plot the shear stress, what he calls tau y x versus uh, the shear rate which is dvx dy. Now, if any of the things that I'm talking about, symbols and stuff, don't make sense, please stop me right there and ask for a clarification. Okay? So, what do I mean by tau? Tau is called the shear stress, stress per unit, force per unit area. Okay? We'll talk about shear stress a little bit more detail soon. Okay? And there is a quantity called the shear stress and there is a quantity called the rate of strain, which is the velocity gradient. And if I measure these two independently for a fluid, water, okay, and then I keep on increasing the rate of strain, that is I keep on increasing the velocity gradient and measure the shear stress and plot them, Newton's law simply says that it will follow a straight line. There is a linear relationship between those two. And the proportionality constant is what we call a property, a viscosity, molecular property. Okay. So this is momentum transfer. This is fluid mechanics. Fluid mechanics is based on this plus conservation loss. Conservation loss and constitutive equations put together give you a set of equations which govern the mechanics of fluids, that which we can study, both statics and dynamics. Okay? So that's a very elementary equation that states that for certain fluids called Newtonian fluids, fluids that obey that law are called in fact Newtonian fluids have a linear relationship between the stress and the rate of strain. So this is the stress 
and this is the rate of strain. What kind of experiment would I do? And I'm trying to now understand what, what is this linear relation to, where does it come from? And maybe before that, let's, let me ask you a question. We're talking about fluids. Uh, we're talking about transport phenomena in fluids, talking about fluid mechanics, momentum transfer, uh, heat transfer, and mass transfer. Okay. But what is a fluid? Let's talk about it. There are a few definitions that come later on in the notes. But what do you understand by a fluid? If you have to define a fluid, how would you define it? If you have to give an example, certainly you can give lots of examples, right? Water. Air, water, coffee, pot, whatever it is. Pardon me? Anything which flows. Okay. So now from that general intuitive understanding, I want to go into a more technical understanding of what a fluid is and how does it differ from a solid. Okay. Anything that flows is a fluid. Okay. I'm going to have some surprises for you uh, in video pretty soon. But that's a very good intuitive definition of what a fluid is, anything that flows. Anybody else? Another definition is, uh, a more technical definition is, uh, a material that needs a shear force to continue to flow. The idea is to flow, but when does it flow? It needs a force, a shear force, and if you stop applying the shear force, it will stop flowing. Solid, for example, when you apply a shear force, it will respond, it will set up internal stresses, and it will reach an equilibrium position. So if I have, for example, think of this, sorry a minute, I think maybe I have that later on. Here I have a picture. So the left-hand side is a solid, the right-hand side is a fluid. So we are trying to understand the Newton's law of viscosity okay, through this thought experiment. So in a solid, the bottom is fixed and I apply a force F on the top. So when I apply a force in the tangential direction, I call that as the shear force. So it is a force acting on a surface, I identify a surface by a normal that is perpendicular to it. Okay? So this force, so we'll have two subscripts. Earlier when I wrote down tau y x, it has two subscripts. We need to understand the meaning of those two subscripts. So this is a force that acts in the positive x direction on a surface with the normal in the y direction. So I would label it as f y x, for example, meaning I'm identifying the surface it is acting on a surface with normal in the y direction. The force itself is acting in the x direction. That is what we would call a shear force. To identify a shear force, you need to identify two things. What is the direction of the force and what is the surface on which it is acting? What is the normal to that surface? So when I do that, the solid will deform. The solid will deform, take a new shape like this, and it will reach an equilibrium position. It's not going to continue to flow. Okay. The force is applied. What happens when they remove the force? If it is an elastic material, it will come back to its position. If it is a plastic material, it may deform. So we need to refine our idea of what a fluid is, what a solid is, because there are materials that behave in between. We cannot classify them either as fluid or as solid. Okay? Whereas in a fluid situation, so here the thought experiment I need to do is, I have a container where uh, it is filled with water, for example, or honey or syrup or whatever, the top plate is moving at a constant velocity by applying a constant force. So I am applying a constant force and it is moving with a velocity v. What is the nature of the velocity profile? This is how it will be. Okay. So at the bottom, the fluid is stagnant. At the top, the fluid is moving with the velocity of the plate. In between, it is varying in a linear fashion. So I can define my velocity gradient as delta V divided by delta Y, if I call this as delta Y. This is what, in the limit, we call it as dV dy, rate of strain, the velocity gradient. Okay? 
Of course, that velocity gradient, our question is, how does that velocity gradient depend on the force that we are applying? Newton's law tries to answer that question. Okay? So, for example, for solids, there is a constitutive equation like that. Does anybody remember what that's called? What is the analogy to the solid? The, the, this displacement will be called the strain. Okay? And so there is a relationship between the stress, that is the force per unit area, and the strain. That's Hooke's law. Okay? So in the case of fluid mechanics, the relationship between the stress, the stress is actually force per unit area. Here we are just talking about force, but I need to know what is the top surface area A. Then the shear stress tau would be F divided by A. So I can measure what is the force I'm applying. I should know what the area on which it applies. And then I can calculate what the battery stretch. My apologies, I need to find the power. No. My apologies. Just give me a minute. I don't know why the power is not working here. used to work last last year <laughs> they replaced it not saying it's charging, <laughs> but let's hope it will work. Uh, <clears throat> so we're talking about the shear stress, which is force per unit area, which we can measure. And we can measure the velocity gradient, because I know the distance between the plate, I know the velocity. So I'll divide one by the other, and I plot that shear stress against the uh, rate of strain. And we, if I get a linear relationship, then I would call the fluid that is in between as a Newtonian fluid. And I will take the slope as a measure of the viscosity. Okay? But the key point is, this fluid will stop moving the moment I stop applying the force. So the definition for a fluid could be one that continues to move as long as there is a shear force. If there is, it cannot sustain a shear force. If I apply a shear force, it will start moving. If you stop it, it will stop moving. Okay? Uh, so in order to continue to flow, it needs a shear flow, okay? Uh, a shear force acting on it. That you can look at it, uh, look at that as one of the definitions of uh, how you would define a fluid, okay? So, the next question that we need to ask is, this is now looking at what are the more fundamental mechanisms that give rise to this kind of a velocity profile, okay? At one end, I move the plate, the other end, I keep the plate stagnant. Let me ask you this question. If I do that experiment where I have the bottom plate that is fixed, the top plate that is initially at zero, and I have a fluid which is also initially at rest, and I start pushing this top plate with a certain force and a certain velocity. In about six weeks, we will come and solve this problem rigorously. But right now, conceptually, let's try to think about what would happen to that fluid? What does your intuition tell you? Do you understand the physical setup? I have a fluid between these two plates that are initially stagnant. It's not moving. And the bottom plate is fixed. It cannot move. The top plate starts moving at time t equal to 0. Okay? And if I put a red dot somewhere here and I keep observing, what do you think would happen? I have, say, for example, two dots. Which dot would move first? The top one would move first. Your intuition is doing very well, right? 
And what would happen to the bottom? It will also move later. It will take some more time. Okay. So if I have a very powerful camera and I take the picture of what the velocity profile looks like at various instants of time, starting from temp equal to zero when I start pushing the plate, what kind of velocity profile would I observe? So at time t equal to zero, the velocity is zero everywhere. Okay. At time equal to 0 0.01 second, the top plate starts moving with a velocity of b, for example. So if I plot the profile, the profile is going to be zero everywhere except very near. I'll get a profile like that. This kind of a thought experiment you should be able to do to understand a problem that is posed for you in an exam. Okay? Because this is how you will understand what kind of assumptions can I make about the nature of the velocity profile. Okay? So as we said, I wait a little longer, the velocity profile will be like this. Then it has hit that dot. That dot will start moving. Okay? And if I wait longer, it's going to be even more like this. And eventually it will be the straight profile that they show here. If you wait long enough, steady state profile is going to be like this. So this is a transient problem. Okay? So we understand now which dot will move first and the next question is why? What is the mechanism that makes this dot move? Initially the fluid is at rest. I'm moving only the top plate. What is the mechanism that causes the next layer of fluid to move? the shear force that is applied on the surface, how does that get transmitted in the perpendicular direction? The force is you are applying in this direction. Your logic is right, but you need to connect what is happening. Uh, when I am applying a force in the horizontal direction, how does that momentum get transferred in the transverse direction? This process is the same for heat transfer and mass transfer. Okay. To seek an answer to that question, what do you need to do? You need to go into the molecular level. Okay? You need to understand how can, you, you can explain with a single word, say friction. Okay? What is friction? It is a force that has its origin in the molecular level. Okay? Now we can talk about what are the fundamental forces that you know in nature. Gravity is one, universal, right? Anything else? Electros electromagnetic forces. Okay, electromagnetic forces is a fundamental force. Okay, um, and then there are two other forces the physicist will tell you. These are the strong and weak nuclear forces. So in nature, we need to worry about only these four forces. Okay? Everything else can be explained as consequences of interactions of these, three, the, of these four forces. The, str the strong and weak nuclear force, we really don't need to worry about it because those relate to nuclear phenomena. Okay? So all we need to worry about is gravity and electromagnetic force. Now the question is, what has electromagnetic force got to do with fluid viscosity? How do two molecules interact with each other? Through their electron clouds. Okay? When the molecules are farther apart, the electron clouds have a negative charge. Right? The protons are in, in, in the center, they have a positive charge. They don't, the fo there are obviously forces. One question that you can ask is, how can I pack all the positively charged protons into a core? There must be some other force that holds them together because positive forces, positive charges must repel, right? That's what leads to that thought that there must be additional strong and weak nuclear forces. But we're not going to cons concern ourselves with that in this course. We're going to look at only the electronic interaction between the clouds. We are not even going to do that, but we want to dig a little bit to understand the origin of these mechanisms, these constitutive models. Okay. So, the material, whether it is water or air, is made up of molecules. The molecules have an electronic cloud and the electron clouds interact exerting a force. 
Okay, and they are in perpetual random motion. So if I take a vessel and then put a lot of molecules of air, what is pressure? It's a force. It's force per unit area, right? But how does that differ from shear force? Shear force is a force that acts tangentially. Pressure force is a force that acts normal to the surface. Okay? So if I have a container like this, there is going to be a pressure force P that acts. Okay? The container, if I pack it with lots of molecules, making the molecules go near each other, they are going to repel because they are the in electronic interaction is going to be repelling each other. Okay? And so th these molecules are then going to bombard against the wall. And that's what translates into a pressure, normal pressure. Okay? So we now understand that ma materials are actually made up of molecules. And molecules have forces of interaction between them. And one can study fluid mechanics at that level, which is called molecular dynamic simulation. You can use that to predict properties of fluids, in fact. And these days, it is practical if you take hundreds of thousands of molecules to do that. Uh, but we are going to look at this problem on a completely different scale. All we are trying to do is understand the origin of these constitutive equations. So with that idea, uh, the idea being that these are made up of molecules and the molecules are going through random motion. Okay? On that random motion, I am superposing a structured motion, which is a velocity in the horizontal direction. Can you now come up with an explanation of how this red dot can start moving? No. Think of it as uh, the interaction that is right, but think of it as, maybe before I talk about it, let me give you another uh, quiz, puzzle. Um, let me see if I can open. Okay, here is uh, another thought experiment. Okay. So I have a railway track. On the track, I have a wagon that is standing. Okay, and next to that, I have parallel to that, I have another railway track, and I have another wagon. I'm not very good in sketching these, but I hope you get the idea. So there are two railway tracks that are parallel to each other. In one, there is a wagon that is sta stationary. In the other one, there is a wagon that is moving with a velocity of v in that direction on the track. Okay? But the experiment that we are going to do is I am going to take, I am going to sit in this wagon, and I am going to take a very powerful hose with water, and I am going to inject that water onto the other plate, the other uh, wagon. What do you think would, and assume it to be a frictionless uh, rail, okay? There's no force holding it behind. What do you think would happen to that wagon? It is hitting it normally, perpendicular. Do you understand the situation? If you understand this, every other puzzle will fall into place. What does your intuition tell you? If you don't understand, please ask me, okay? Do you understand the scenario I'm setting up for you? two parallel tracks. In one, the tra train is moving with a certain velocity. While it is moving, it has a jet with another velocity, uh, W, for example. Okay, And that jet is hitting the uh, wagon on the other track, which is on a frictionless rail. What do you think would happen to that? What are the possible things that can happen to it? It'll move. In the, which direction? The on the track. On the Very good. Why? Why do you think so? Uh, because the water has the velocity that direction too. Exactly. Does everybody get that? So when 
this this water jet also has a velocity v because it is moving at the velocity. So it has a momentum in the x direction. Let's call this as the x direction. <coughs> that momentum, <coughs> of course, is being transferred in the y direction because it also has a w velocity. But when it hits the other wagon, it has a component of the momentum in the x direction. Okay? So that will transfer that momentum and the wagon should start moving. Of course, if the force is large and it can tip over also. Right? So but what I want you to understand is the mechanism by which a molecule that is undergoing random motion from one plane to another plane but also has a directed motion caused by the moving plate, for example, can transfer its momentum. <coughs> Is that clear? Okay. <coughs> so there are lots of molecules near the plate, and those molecules, once they bombard on the plate, are going to pick up the momentum in the x direction from the plate. And then they are going to bounce back due to normal thermal motion. That is the nature of the molecules. Okay. So when they go into a region where the momentum is lower, that is molecules are not moving in the x direction as fast, they are going to impart their momentum and those molecules will, it's like billiard balls, they will start moving. And that process is called the molecular diffusion of momentum. Okay. So that is a slow process, so it will take, depending on the viscosity of the fluid. <coughs> <coughs> So that process is what gets the momentum transferred in the y direction when you have flow in the x direction. And this relationship captures that. Okay, so here you see tau y x. That simply means it's a shear stress acting in the x direction on a y surface. Y surface meaning with a normal in the y direction. That shear stress is related to the velocity gradient dvx dy and the slope is a constant that defines this property called the viscosity. And the process is molecular process. So we are not examining the molecular details of the process. We are saying whatever happens there, this equation is going to give me the correct relationship between the velocity gradient and the forces. So I don't need to worry about at the molecular level. So we are going to treat the fluid as a continuum. So we'll see what a continuum postulate is. And <clears throat> so the transfer phenomena that we are going to study is going to be at the continuum level on a scale and it's going to relate macroscopic observations between various fluxes and the quantities. <coughs> what is this one called? Do you remember? For energy, Fourier's law of heat conduction. Okay. I don't know why. Okay. It's called the Fourier's law of heat conduction. What does that relate? It's for conduction mechanism only. Okay. <clears throat> so you have to imagine that this is a solid block and one side of it is kept at a high temperature, the other side is kept at a low temperature. Okay. And a temperature gradient develops. Here there is no molecules that are actually in a solid, molecules don't move, right? So how does the energy get transferred? <coughs> it is also a molecular process, but the molecules in their position have vibrational energy. Okay? So if you heat them up, they are going to vibrate much faster, setting aside the next molecule also to vibrate. Okay? And that process is the one that transfers through intermolecular interactions uh, energy from one end to the other end. <coughs> and what is this one called? Fick's law of diffusion. Okay, what does that relate? It relates the mass flux. Okay, here maybe the thought experiment that you should do is let me put up this example for you. <coughs> I'm going to take a container. I'm going to divide that into two parts with a simple plate. And I'm going to divide them in such a way that I can put, say, 100 grams of water and on this side, 100 grams of methanol. 
Methanol is lighter in density than water. So it's going to occupy more volume. Okay? So the plate is not going to be right in the middle, it's going to be on one side. And I take this and put it on a balance, a fulcrum, so that initially they are both 100 grams and it's going to be in perfect balance. Are you following the thought experiment? Now I'm going to remove this plate. After I poured carefully 100 grams of water on this side and 100 grams of methanol on this side, the right side being larger in volume because it is going to be smaller, and then I remove the separation plate. What do you think will happen? They will mix, right? What causes that mixing? Across this plane, there is a concentration gradient. There are more molecules of water on this side and more molecules of methanol on the other side. So, as we said, the molecules interact with each other. If you take a water molecule in the middle, it sees only other water molecules. So, it's perfectly fine. Okay? So, it's not going to, it may undergo random motion, but not a directed motion. Okay? So, it's going to stay on the average in that neighborhood. Similarly, if I take a methanol molecule here, it's surrounded by methanol molecules there. But if I take a water molecule right on the plane on one side, on the other side it sees only methanol molecule. So the forces of attraction or repulsion between these two molecules are going to be different. And that sets in motion the migration of the water molecules on this side and migration of the methanol molecules on the other side. That is the molecular diffusion process. Now, really, physically, materials are transferring. And if you wait long enough, they will completely equilibrate, meaning on any point, the concentration of methanol and concentration of water will be the same, meaning in terms of molecules, the average number of molecules of methanol and water surrounding a molecule will be the same. So the forces of attraction will be the same, and they will equilibrate. But that, when that happens, what should happen to this side? Just tilt over, flip over because there will be more weight on the right-hand side. Okay? So that very beautifully illustrates this idea of the driving force for mass transfer by diffusion process. It is also a molecular process. Okay? So we can understand heat transfer, mass transfer, and uh, momentum transfer from purely as a molecular phenomenon. <coughs> and in each case, there is a unique linear relationship between the stress or the flux, heat flux or the mass flux, and the velocity gradient or the temperature gradient or the concentration gradient that drives that flux. And the proportionality constant in each case is a material property. Depends on what material I'm using. For example, this DAB here is called the diffusivity of A in B, binary diffusion coefficient. Right? So it is going to depend on what two materials there are. And we can measure that. There are techniques for measuring that. And you can find these values cataloged in Bersiver and Lightfoot as well. Okay, any questions? <clears throat> we are still talking conceptually about what are the similarities between the three transport mechanisms from a molecular level, and then we will build up slowly from there. Now, if you are absolutely quiet, I'm not sure whether how to interpret that, that you don't understand anything I've talked about. <laughs> Or uh, everything is perfectly clear. No questions? Yeah. The moment you talk about in the final moment they did in the profile of it and it is straight. Yes. Um for a Newtonian fluid that'll be straight. We will solve this problem later on. The answer to that question is actually in writing the force balance equations and solving and discovering that the velocity profile is in fact linear for that particular case. It's not going to be linear, for example, in the transient case. It will keep changing okay, until it reaches a steady state where it is linear. Okay. <coughs> so you can ask the question, is that explainable from a molecular point of view, uh, 
the linearity. You, you can, from the molecular point of view, you can argue that the velocity should decrease. Why should it decrease? Here you have molecules that are that have very large x momentum, right? And they bump into the next level of molecules that have a lower momentum. So in the process, they lose some momentum. Okay, so the momentum that is due to friction. In fact, this is why I said viscosity characterizes the friction of the fluid. It is essentially friction in the fluid. You can have friction in the solid when you rub one solid against the other. But viscosity is a measure of friction in the fluid. If the viscosity is very low, what do we say? It's almost a frictionless fluid. Helium, for example, at very, very low temperatures, minus 270 degrees or so like that, will behave like a frictionless fluid. Okay. <clears throat> so due to friction, there is loss of momentum. And so that can explain from a molecular point of view why the molecules on this level or this level are moving on the average with a lower velocity. And at the other end, of course, it is kept at zero velocity because there is no x component of the flow. Okay? So you can understand that the velocity should be decreasing, but not necessarily linearly. That depends on the force balances. So you need to write the force balance equation and solve it to answer why that is uh, linear. It's a good question. The same thing applies for heat transfer and mass transfer. Another way of asking that question is, is this always true? Will it always be linear? And we will see that it is not unless the fluid is Newtonian. If the fluid is non-Newtonian, you can have a situation where the velocity profile is not linear. What do we mean by non-Newtonian? If we do this experiment where we measure the shear stress and the rate of strain and plot, and we get a set of data points like this, then I don't know what's happening to my computer. <laughs> If, if it goes like this, then we will call that as non-Newtonian. So it is defined in a negative way, anything that is not Newtonian. So you could have a non-Newtonian fluid that's like this, with a decreasing slope or with an increasing slope. One would be called shear thinning, the other one would be called shear thickening. That is, as you increase the shear, the viscosity is not a constant, but changes. And we will see examples of those fluids later on. Any other question? Yeah. Is it non-Newtonian only because, like, basically, no matter what you do, you get a kind of No, 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 no. It is a material property. It is a material property. It's not the dynamics of not being able to reach an equilibrium position. Certain materials will <coughs> will not exhibit this linear relationship between the stress and the rate of strain. You can again understand it from a physical point of view. For example, which be fluids will behave <coughs> in a shear thinning way? What do we mean by shear thinning is, as I increase the shear rate, the viscosity seems to decrease. Okay, that is this. Let me go back to that one because it doesn't erase. So if I plot the shear stress versus the rate of strain, if I get a behavior like this, I would call that as shear thinning. Which means, as I increase the shear, the fluid seems to thin. Now, what is the viscosity? Viscosity is the slope of this, right? So the local visco the viscosity now changes with shear rate. Okay. So if I look at the viscosity here, <coughs> it looks like it's very high. It's very viscous. It's not willing to move that easily. Okay. But at high shear rate, it moves very easily. Polymeric fluids do that. What are polymeric fluids? Polyethylene, uh, plastics, and stuff like that. They are long chain molecules. So if I take the long chain molecule in the device and put it, this is a, called a Kuwait device, okay? So at very low shear rate, these molecules are going to be like spaghetti-like structure, intertwined. So spaghetti is not going to move that easily when I apply the force. So it looks like its viscosity is very high. But I keep continuing to increase this velocity gradient. Then the molecules stretch themselves out and align themselves in the direction of the flow. Then the molecules flow very easily. Okay? So you can explain what kind of a, we observe experimentally that polymeric fluids tend to behave shear thinning way, and we can understand why that is. The other example is shear thickening, which will also be called non-Newtonian. So this will have 
Uh, it's called very low initially, but it becomes very high as you try to move them faster. <coughs> a good example is petroleum uh, mud, drilling mud, that they use in the drilling fluids. So it's basically particles, fluid particles suspended in water. So you move them at a very high velocity, these, these sand grains bump against each other, increasing the resistance to flow. Okay? So if you put them in a viscometer and try to measure the viscosity, you'll find that viscosity is higher, at higher flow than it is at lower flow. Okay? So there are anything like this would be called non-Newtonian. There are a number of other behavior that I have kind of listed in the notes that you will see. <coughs> Any other questions? <coughs> Almost an hour passed and we're just still in the first page. <laughs> but I think we've talked about a lot that is in the notes. So I'm kind of going to ask you to read the notes on your own, reinforcing some of these ideas. Okay. Um, so here I say watch the video by G.I. Tyler. I think you should do that by the time we come for the next class. And watch the video on powers of 10. Let me see whether I can pull that out. Has anybody heard of that film or seen that film, Powers of 10? <coughs> Let me see if I can find it. Watch this carefully. I'm not going to comment. <coughs> Oops. What did you, what did you get from that? <coughs> I guess it keeps repeating itself. Let me close that. Pause that. Does anybody want to comment on any idea that comes to your mind after seeing that? What is it about, you think? What is the creator of that trying to convey to you? There is a website associated with this Powers of Ten. We can go and explore a little bit more about what he's trying to convey. But if you just see the video, <coughs> what comes to your mind? Excellent. Very good. So we can look at any phenomena in nature, and it occurs over a wide range of scale. And you saw from far away in the galaxy zooming in every time at next power of 10. Okay? And at certain scales, you can see galaxies. At certain scales, you can see Earth. At certain scales, you can see molecules. And then you go to, uh, I mean, DNA, down to molecules, down to subatomic particles, all the way down to quarks. Okay? That seems to be the limit that we can understand. Yeah. What was the last picture? The last one, <clears throat> the last one I think, is the quark. Does it show? Nucleus of the carbon face to face with a single proton, examining quarks. <coughs> that was the last one. Quark is supposed to be the 
one of the smaller subatomic particles okay, <coughs> on their scale. Now, after seeing this, um, if I ask you to define a point, how would you define a point? Velocity at a point, pressure at a point, temperature at a point. We use that commonly, right? Is that relative to something else? It is relative to something else, okay? So for an astrophysicist, a galaxy could be a continuum. The structure of the galaxy could be described by field equations that have continuous uh, vari variation. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> whereas fluid mechanics we saw could be looked at as discrete particles, molecules, or we can look at as a continuum. Okay? When we talk about continuum, trust this. <coughs> We are going to describe velocity, okay, temperature, pressure at a particular point, stress at a particular point. Okay, what is that point? How small can that point be? It is in relation to what we are looking at. So the continuum postulate gives us a guideline. It says the mathematical limit of a point tending to zero remains large compared to the molecular dimensions. So I'm not going to go into submolecular or molecular level. I want, to, my, I want my zero, concept of a zero, to remain larger than molecular scale. So when I'm talking, when I'm talking, you have all done calculus, right? So when I write dv dy, what do I mean by that? I actually mean that limit delta y going to zero, delta v divided by delta y. That is how I limit the, define the limit process. Okay, that's how I define my derivative. So here I'm saying this delta y is going to zero. Okay, so continuum postulate states that that limit, the mathematical limit of delta y going to zero, must remain large compared to the molecular dimensions, so that I don't see individual molecules, but I see only a collection of molecules. Let's do another thought experiment. Okay. To illustrate this idea of a continuum postulate, we are still talking about scales, talking about phenomena. So I, I'm wanting to define what is the density of air in this room. Okay. So how would you go about finding out, determining what is the density of air in this room? What is density? What is the definition of density? Mass divided by volume. Excellent. So I need to measure what is the mass of air in this room. I need to measure what is the volume of air in this room. If I get those two numbers, I plug it in, that's my density. Okay. Now I'm going to do uh, another thought experiment where I'm going to plot this density against this delta M <coughs> or delta B. So in the first experiment, I'm going to measure all the mass in this room and take the total volume, divide one by the other, the volume is really huge in the point. Then I say I'm going to cut half of this room. I'm going to take the volume only of one half and find its mass. What do you think the density will be? Will it be the same or different? This room is pretty homogeneous, right? So there's no reason for dense air to be denser here than there. Okay? So you would expect the same value. I'm going to take that and half it again, one quarter. Okay? And I'm going to get another value. So if I keep repeating this, I'm going to get a constant value. And that is what I mean by density of the fluid. Now I can I will reach if I do this division, how many times do you think I need to do this division before I get into a molecular scale? This is not power of ten, this is power of two. We're just dividing by two every time. Have you heard this story? If I give you a piece of paper and you tear this, put them two together, okay? So you have two sheets together. You tear them, put four sheets, you tear them. You do it 30 times. How thick do you think the paper will be? From here to almost halfway to the moon. <laughs> that's, that's how thick it will be, okay? <clears throat> So that power of 2 basically says that if I keep dividing this, pretty soon, in about 30 attempts, 
I'm going to reach a scale where the sample volume that I take is going to be so tiny that I will capture only few molecules. Sometimes I may capture three molecules, sometimes I may capture two molecules, four molecules, whatever. Then what happens to the density? The mass is determined by the number of molecules in there, right? So if I capture at random different number of molecules each time, what do you think will happen to the density? It will fluctuate wildly, right? Because I don't know what's going to be. So as I approach this, I'll find that the, this density graph behaves like this. Okay? So that experiment sets a limit for me as to how small my sample volume should be. That is what my point is. My point cannot be smaller than that. Okay? So that is this point. Below which the mean free path do you know what a mean free path is? Mean is comparable to sample volume. Okay. So mean free path, let's call it as lambda, and the sample volume, let's call it as dv, the volume, differential volume. Okay. So if the differential volume is the same as what is mean free path? Do you remember? No? Mean free path? In physics in physical chemistry, you must have done this a long time ago. The distance that two molecules travel before they collide into each other. On the average, what is the distance two molecules travel before they collide into each other? That is the mean average free path average distance that it travels freely before it bumps into another molecule. Okay? That's what is called a mean free path. That's related to, of course, the pressure. The higher the pressure, the closer the molecules are, the smaller the mean free path. So if my sample volume becomes smaller than that, then continuum hypothesis goes out of the window. Okay? So when I say that a point is small enough compared to uh, large, larger, should remain larger compared to the mean free path, so that I have at least 100 molecules, so that I can talk about an average density, an average pressure. What is pressure? Pressure is the net force exerted on a small surface. So if I have one or two molecules in, uh, bombarding onto it, I will have a pressure fluctuation. So that's random. So I must have at least 100 molecules, 200 molecules that are bombarding to give me an average pressure. So the concept of a mean, uh, the concept of a continuum postulate is. I'm going to look at all fluids as a continuum. I'm going to ignore the discrete nature of this material, and I'm going to define average properties. So I can talk of average velocity at a point, average velocity, a temperature at a point, etc. Any questions on that? Are the concepts getting difficult to understand, or are you guys okay? Any questions? <coughs> So we saw in powers of 10 that we could study nature at any length scale, okay? And there is a whole wide range of length scales of interest. So it depends on what question that we are interested in. As chemical engineers, what are we interested in? We are interested in predicting the performance of processes, okay? It could be a distillation column, it could be a reactor, fluidized bed reactor. I want to know how well does it perform? What is its efficiency? What is its separation efficiency? Etc. <coughs> how do you normally do in the undergraduate program? And how is this course going to enhance that knowledge that you have? At the undergraduate level, I think all of you are chemical engineers, or are there others, mechanical, civil engineer? My apologies when I start using examples from chemical engineering. <laughs> I hope it's not a problem. But it does, the course does not depend on, you're not going to do process design, you're going to do fluid mechanics, heat transfer, okay? But the examples I draw are uh, from chemical engineering. Anybody else from any other field? Biological. Okay, that's good. Uh, a lot of chemical engineers these days are turning themselves into pseudo-biologists. <laughs> uh, so, performance of the 
chemical plant, chemical processes, um, or it could be separation of biological processes. We study typically in assuming what I call a lumped homogeneous input output model. That is, it's a black box. Okay? I put in something and I get out something, and I want to relate the input and the output. So, Aspen, Hysis, these kind of process simulators look at the process on the equipment scale. And by knowing that the mass is conserved, the energy is conserved, the momentum is conserved, if I know what is inside, I should know what is coming outside because it's conserved. Okay? So, that gives rise to algebraic equations relating the input and output, but there's something fascinating happening inside that vessel that is fluid mechanics, heat transfer, mass transfer, chemical reaction. These are all occurring at the molecular level. So when we use a model on the scale, on the equipment scale, large scale, we are assuming that this is happening homogeneously inside that. So everywhere it is occurring at the same rate, for example. In a distillation column, we say that the composition in a tray is uniform everywhere on the tray. It is not true. Okay? And it is not true, we use fudge factors, like I'm going to use a Murphy tray efficiency, something called uh, an efficiency. In reactors, for example, we assume that everything is perfectly mixed, well mixed CSTRs. It is not true in reality. Then we say, okay, I'm going to do a residence time study to find out how long a particular molecule stays. What is the residence time distribution to correct for the correct conversion? Okay? So there is a lot of empiricism involved in using Aspen Hysis type of models. And these have been empirically developed. And so Aspen and Hysis can do a reliable job of predicting the performance of a given process unit. Uh, but when you want to do scale up from one scale to another scale or when you're developing new processes, there's not much help from Aspen and Hysis. So we are going to go one level deeper. Okay? So we are going to use, uh, examine what happens in fact <coughs> at the continuum scale. Towards the end of this course, we'll go from continuum scale, the so-called interpenetrating continuum scale. But we, right now we are going to focus on this level of modeling. So this graph illustrates the various scales at which we can study fluid mechanics. We have already talked about molecular dynamic simulation. There are simulation software that are available today that will allow you something called Gromax, for example, that will allow you to do molecular dynamic simulation of fluids and predict the properties of viscosity, diffusivity, thermal conductivity, etc. But there are processes that are occurring at a lower scale that determine its fate at the molecular interaction level. As we saw from the powers of 10, there is a continuum spectrum of influence. Always the lower scale affects the next higher scale, which affects the next higher scale, etc. So here we are, we are identifying four different scales, from the molecular scale to continuum scale to interpenetrating continua scale to the equipment scale. Okay? So we want to climb up to them. But to study at the molecular dynamic scale, we need to assume that these molecules have a force field that are exerted because of electronic interaction between these molecules. And that interaction potential must be specified. If I know what is the force field for hydrogen, what is the force field for oxygen, when I put them, how do they interact, then I will be able to predict the mixture properties, for example. So either I must have another model at a lower level, which is what is called the quantum mechanical calculations, <coughs> or I do experiments in the lab to get those intermolecular potentials, and we feed them into molecular dynamic simulation, out comes all the properties that I need, density, viscosity, surface tension. I can predict all this from MD simulation. But that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, I'm going to measure these. I'm going to devise experiments where I can measure the viscosity, density, surface tension, and use that as an input to the continuum scale. So my starting point in this course is a continuum scale. So you should understand what a continuum scale is. That is, a scale at which the point going to zero remains large compared to the mean free path. So I can talk of velocity as a continuous function, okay? velocity gradients as a continuous function. Okay? And uh, so there are a number of model equations, Navier-Stokes equation, uh, Stokesian dynamics, etc. We'll talk a little bit about each of them as we go along. Now, if I can solve, this course is about developing and solving these equations. If I can solve that, I'll be able to predict what are drag and lift forces, what is interface heat and mass transfer. Okay? So I will be able to predict 
the drag force on a plane or the lift force on a plane. I'll be able to predict what is the load that a plane can lift by solving that Navier-Stokes equation. Aerodynamics is about solving the Navier-Stokes equation. Fluid mechanics and chemical engineering. Fluid mechanics, if you think about it, is useful for a whole range of engineers. Not only chemical engineers, but mechanical engineers study it, aeronautical engineers study it, biological engineers. It's very important. If you think about the body, 80% of it is fluid. And if you look at, when I take a medicine, what happens to the medicine? It diffuses, it convects, it dissolves, and it transposes itself, right? So this is why chemical engineers are a natural fit to study the pharmacokinetics, the models for that, because whatever we have learned about chemical engineering in plant could apply, because this is the best biochemical reactor there is, <laughs> okay? So the, all these principles apply very easily to that, <clears throat> okay? So we will be able to predict these macroscopic quantities, dra drag and lift forces. So majority of the course is going to be exploring this link on a continuum scale, okay? But when you have thousands and billions of particles, like in fluidized bed, or in bubble column reactor where you are aerating, like you have a fermenter, for example, okay, and you are aerating air to keep the fermentation process going. So it's a multi-phase flow. Okay, there is a liquid and there is a gas, and oxygen is being transferred from the gas phase into the liquid phase. So in order to study that at a continuum scale is an impossible task, because there are billions of air bubbles. A good example is the oil spill that occurred last year. There was no predictive capability. We could not predict where the oil will end up. We still don't have, because that's such a complex problem. The oil droplet will break up into billions and billions of droplets. The gas that is released from there, and they could be carried by the uh, convection currents in the ocean. So there we introduce this idea of an interpenetrating continua. We will do that towards the end of this course to be able to solve such complex flow situations, multiple flow situations. And then we will be able to look at equipment scale behavior by using a detailed uh, hierarchical level of models. That's what this whole course is going to be about. Did I scare you enough? Anybody scared so far? <laughs> no? All right. Any questions? Okay. <coughs> I think we already talked about a lot of these things. I just took a lot of these definitions and concepts from the wiki uh, web page. Fluid mechanics is the study of fluids. Mechanics is study of forces. So when you apply forces to fluid, how does the fluid behave? That's what the fluid mechanics is. Heat transfer, mass transfer, we have seen the analogy in a similar way. Okay? So if I maintain a temperature gradient, I can drive the energy by conduction mechanism from one plane to another plane. If I maintain a concentration gradient, I can drive the mass, the species, from one place to the other place. If I maintain a pressure difference, I can drive the flow, bulk flow from one place to another place. Okay, we already talked about this idea of a continuum. So fluid mechanics is a branch of so-called continuum mechanics. Okay, what is continuum mechanics? It includes both solid mechanics and fluid mechanics. <clears throat> So solids can also, they are also made up of molecules, but they can also be thought of as a continuous mixture. But we need a constitutive relationship that filters out whatever happens at the molecular level. Hooke's law is an example for solid mechanics. Newton's law viscosity is an example for fluid mechanics that allows us to go away from the um, uh, discrete molecular level to the continuum level. Uh, fluid mechanics, as I said, is mathematically complex. We are going to learn a lot of so uh, solutions to ordinary and partial differential equations in this course. And towards the end of this course, we will introduce uh, ComSol and other software packages that solve the governing equations for fluid mechanics. And that is called computational fluid mechanics, which is one of my research areas. And I guess they were all new graduate students, right? So if you're interested in research in this area, um, you will get an idea from this course, but you can also talk to me about what kind of projects that we have. Now, experimental fluid dynamic basically attempts to measure things. Still mechanics of flows, but we try to measure what is the velocity, what are the forces in the fluid. And there are a lot of techniques that are being developed, advanced techniques like laser Doppler anemometer and hot wire anemometer. We will not go into the detail. There are separate courses on experimental fluid mechanics uh, given in mechanical engineering. Okay, so I think maybe we will look at these two videos.
Uh, one is the lower Reynolds number uh, kinematics, the other one is viscoelastic flow. And uh, <clears throat> again, look at this. Oh my god, how do I get there? Can you hear anything? <laughs> I cannot. Which gave rise to the flow is reversed. This may lead to some surprising situations which might almost make one believe that the fluid has mm -hmm. a memory of its own. Here are two concentric cylinders. The fluid can be moved by turning the inner cylinder with this handle. The annulus between them is filled with glycerine. Into this space, I introduce some dye, which stays put owing to the high viscosity of the glycerine. Note its position before I start turning it. I now turn it four times pushing the handle clockwise. The dye seems to mix as a drop of milk mixes when it is stirred into a cup of tea. Now I reverse the direction. Predict, what do you think will happen? Obviously, you can expect <laughs> There must be something in it, otherwise we won't show it. <laughs> Good guess. <clears throat> and after turning exactly four turns, the dyed area reappears in its original position with a little fuzziness due to molecular diffusion. You've seen it? Yeah, but he did it with three different dots. Right. I have seen that on YouTube. So if you take red, blue, and whatever it is, that mixes. So the color will become completely black, and then you can separate them out. Um, this was the original video by Gia Taylor. You're going to be hearing a lot about Gia Taylor, one of the brilliant fluid dynamicists that ever lived. He lived to have 84 or something like that. His work is collected in four volumes. And each one, each paper that he published is opened up a whole new area. There are monographs written on just one problem that he studied, because thousands of other people have studied, continue to study that. So <clears throat> it's a very inspirational person when you read his papers. And so that's why he was asked to make this 30-minute video. This is only a small clip from there. And the 30-minute video has a whole range of fluid mechanics phenomena all occurring until low Reynolds number flows. Now, t tell me, you obviously knew what was going to happen, but why does that happen? Uh, because of the viscosity of the Right. So, when you say viscosity, you have something in mind. For example, if I repeat this and it's going, here, yeah, he has chosen a very viscous fluid. Okay. Why did he choose a very viscous fluid? You will see later on. The higher the viscosity, the lower the viscous fluid. So anybody who does not know what a viscous fluid is, the number of the fluid you are saying must not matter. So it's an unless number is a measure of ratio of inertia to viscous forces. So if you keep inertia forces small and the viscous forces large, then the Reynolds number is low then something like this happens. This is called, the pro phenomenon is called kinematic reversibility, okay? So what is happening is, as he is applying the force to the inner cylinder, okay, so there are two cylinders. So the inner cylinder is being rotated. That's what it does. So when the boundary rotates, that sets in motion the molecules next to it and the molecules next to it. So they all start moving. Okay? 
the same process that we talked about when we talked flow between two parallel plates. Here, it's a concentric annulus. In fact, two parallel plates is difficult to do experimentally, but concentric cylinders you can do. So when you do that, if you look from the top, you're going to have this one moving, okay? And that sets in motion the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer, etc. okay? So if the viscosity is very high, then this effect will propagate very quickly. And you will see mathematically why that happens later on. So, but it is reversible, meaning if I move this two inches this way, the molecule moves from here to there. If I move it exactly two inches backwards, it will move back to its position. Except for what he talks about, molecular diffusion. There's some fuzziness, because molecules are still randomly moving, but higher viscosity means they're not moving randomly as rigorously. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So if I do the same experiment with water, not syrup, what do you think would happen? It will not work as nicely. Okay? And if I do this, not at such gentle, gentle speeds, but I put a motor and I start <laughs> whipping it around, what would happen? You will not be able to reverse it. It will be completely mixed. It will be irreversible. Okay? So what are we doing in that process? We are lowering the, remember Reynolds number is some characteristic length, velocity, density over viscosity. So if I lower this, I'm increasing the Reynolds number. I'm increasing the inertia. So what does that mean? When I, when I have inertia, if a particle is moving from there, when I stop the plate, the particle is not able to stop because it has inertia. It will want to continue to move. So if I create a situation wherever the inertia is dominant, either by increasing the velocity or decreasing the uh, viscosity, if in, in inertia dominates, then I will not be able to reverse it. Okay. So that, any questions? Do you understand what has happened in that video? Okay. <clears throat> I guess we are almost out of time. Uh, There are many situations, however, for which these models are quite inadequate. This is especially the case when you are dealing with materials containing large molecules. This ball, for example, bounces quite vigorously, like an elastic solid. Yet, it really is a fluid. We'll come back. Can you believe that is a fluid? He's taking a ball and hitting it, and it bounces, and he's claiming that it is a fluid. So this. Uh, video illustrates that really we cannot classify any material found on earth as either being purely solid or purely fluid. So um, he will show at the Back end of this later. experiment. Here's a viscous material which I can pour into this beaker. No, I think I'll use this beaker instead. I can even cut it to length. Honey has a high viscosity, but no elasticity. Remember the fluid ball? It was like an elastic solid during the short impact of bouncing. An elastic solid has a preferred configuration to which it will return when stresses are removed. A viscoelastic fluid behaves similarly if the stress has been applied only for a short time. But in contrast to the elastic solid, the fluid's memory is not perfect. This time-lapse sequence shows that if the stress acts for a time long compared with the relaxation times of the fluid, the fluid forgets its previous state. In reality, it took 45 minutes for the force of gravity to change the ball into a puddle. This is a container. Okay. <clears throat> so that small video illustrates that there are material that cannot be easily classified as either a solid or a fluid. So viscoelastic material are those that have 
viscous properties like a fluid, and elastic properties like a solid. So the molecular nature of interaction in those fluids are complicated. And so Newton's law of viscosity will not hold for them. You need to come up with other relationships. So the important point that you need to realize is Newton's law of viscosity is an empirical one that captures the molecular interaction and is not valid for all molecules because all molecules don't behave the same way. So the long chain molecules have viscoelastic property and that will be a separate course on nanotube mechanics. Polymers is a very important area. And we will just talk briefly about other types of constitutive relationships, but focus this course mostly on Newtonian fluids. So we'll stop there and uh, continue on uh, Thursday.